The Kinahan Cartel might have started off as a relatively small crime group in Ireland back in the 90s, but that isn't the case today. Known as one of the largest organised crime groups in the world, the Kinahan Cartel is seen on the same level as the Sicilian Mafia and various Colombian and Mexican cartels. But who is the man behind the Kinahan Cartel? And just how did he manage to go from leading a small crime group in Ireland to becoming an internationally wanted crime boss? This is the story of Christopher Vincent Kinahan Sr. Born in 1957 in Dublin, Ireland, Christopher Vincent Kinahan grew up in a relatively middle-class family. With his father being a dairy farm manager, Kinahan and his family were quite well off for the time. From a young age, Christopher was given the nickname Christy by those who knew him well. But even though this might be quite a sweet nickname, Christy was anything but that. The older Christy got, the more disillusioned with education he became. It wasn't that he was unintelligent. In fact, he was really quite smart. He simply got bored with traditional education and dropped out of school. But even then, things didn't seem that bad. Upon entering his 20s, it looked like Christy would perhaps have a normal life. After all, he had a job as a taxi driver, a wife, and a young child as well. But he was dissatisfied with his life. He found his life yet again boring, and more than that, he wanted to earn money. A lot more money, in fact. At first, Christie began his criminal career by committing petty crimes. Things like stealing cars, burglary, and check fraud. But then, during the early 80s, the crime scene in Ireland changed dramatically. Due to Russia's invasion of Afghanistan, heroin had started flooding the European markets. Before long, many countries had a serious drug problem, Ireland included. It was a ready-made market, Michael O'Sullivan claimed. At the time, Michael was one of the top police officers in Ireland and was leading an investigation into the sudden surge of drugs in the community. This evidently led him to investigate Christie and his criminal activities later on. Ironically, one minute in the early 90s, there was no heroin available, and the next minute, it was everywhere. It devastated the inner city. It deprived communities. Whole families were on drugs, the officer later stated. At first, the drug dealer who oversaw the sale of the drugs was a man called Larry June. He had access to cheap heroin and was able to sell it on for a much higher price. At the height of his criminal career, Larry controlled roughly 95% of Ireland's drug trade. However, in 1985, he was arrested and sentenced to 14 years in jail for drug trafficking. With Larry behind bars, Christie recognized his opportunity. The low-level criminal had made a few associates during his time at doing petty crime, and it was through one of these people that he was introduced to some drug dealers. Christie had observed how lucrative dealing drugs could be by observing Larry, and he was intent on getting into the game himself. Before long, Christie was helping to arrange shipments of the drug into Ireland, whilst making sure to keep himself in the background. That way, he was able to take in a large portion of the profits, but he didn't have to worry about the police as much as others. By 1986, Christie had become Ireland's biggest supplier of heroin. In order to try and throw police off of his trail, the crime boss would make efforts to pose as an English businessman. He rented a modest apartment in a Dublin suburb, which served as his base to store his drugs, which he would then distribute to vast amounts of street dealers. When working in Dublin, he would drive a red sports car and dress impeccably, all to perpetuate his image as a rich Englishman. It was at this time that he gained the nickname Dapper Don, due to his smart outfits. However, he wasn't able to keep the police in the dark for long. Due to being relatively new to the drug dealing game, Christie inevitably made some critical mistakes when it came to distributing his product. And in late 1986, Christie was arrested after police caught him with 117,000 pounds worth of heroin whilst he was in Clontarf, Dublin. It is thought he could have possibly been trying to distribute the drug to some of his street dealers and was unlucky enough to get caught in the act he was sentenced to six years in prison. Being locked up didn't stop Christie though. He was extremely intelligent and had many ways to outsmart police. Whilst behind bars, he was able to get a computer and used it to hone his skills as an international drug trafficker. He kept in touch with various drug traffickers that he'd worked with prior to being arrested. Once he was released from prison, Christie set about expanding his crime group from a small time gang in Dublin to an international cartel. With the connections he had managed to make whilst in prison, Christie began trafficking drugs from South America into not only Ireland, but the UK as well. As the market opened up for him, Christie's gang also got bigger until its reach expanded well into Europe. However, 
In 1997, he was once again arrested and charged with possession of stolen checks. Christie again did not let his time in jail go wasted. While serving four years in jail, the crime boss studied for two degrees in Spanish and Russian. He even refused early release in 2001 so that he could complete his second degree. These degrees went on to serve him well once he was finally released as it enabled him to create more contacts in the criminal underworld. Not long after serving his prison time, Christie moved to Spain, where he lived for around 15 years. This is where he is suspected of setting up multiple drug routes into Western Europe from Mexican and Colombian cartels and the Russian mafia. It wasn't long before Christie had established his cartel as a key player in the international drug market. Once he'd done that, new avenues quickly began opening up for him. In a bid to earn more money, he expanded his cartel from just narcotics trafficking to include money laundering and arms dealing. At the height of his criminal career, Christie had grown his cartel to be worth an estimated £1 billion, though it could be more. With this much money, the crime boss knew that he was a huge target for both police organizations and other gangs. With this in mind, he began thinking of new ways to hide his illegal activities and the money he got from them. He also wanted to make sure that he didn't return to jail. So, in around 2015, he decided to move to Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Whilst they do have an extradition treaty with the UK and Ireland, it can be quite difficult getting criminals released to them due to complex political reasons. During his stay in Dubai, the crime lord began setting up various different businesses and registering them under his middle name, Christopher Vincent. He made sure to make the business look as official as possible while secretly using them as a money laundering scheme. But in 2020, he took things to the next level, or at least he tried to. By 2020, Christie had handed control of the Kinahan cartel to his son, Daniel. Those of you who are boxing fans might be aware of him as he is a well-known promoter in the boxing world. And if you are long-term fans of this channel, you might have seen the other two videos that we've done on Daniel Kinahan himself. If you haven't seen those yet, they're definitely worth checking out as they delve a little deeper into the Kinahan's cartel and the gang feuds that have come about because of it. For a little bit of context, in 2016, there was an attempted hit on Daniel's life during a public weigh-in for a fight in Ireland. None of the hitmen were successful in their attempts. However, it brought to light just how involved in the criminal world the Kinahans are. It is possible that Christie perhaps didn't like how public his business was becoming. And in order to shield himself from the police a little bit more, he appointed Daniel as the head of the cartel. What do you think? Despite handing over the leadership role though, Christie still liked to work in the background, securing new deals and growing his family's power. And his latest plan was one that would have surely aided him in doing just that. Christie's idea was to buy nine obsolete de Havilland Canada DHC Buffaloes from the Egyptian Air Force. What could he possibly want with nine planes? Well, his plan was to use the small aircraft in order to traffic drugs through Africa and onto countries all over the world. The planes he was looking at are renowned for their short takeoff and landing capabilities, making them perfect to fly to locations that are more remote or don't have a runway. But how did Christie get into the position to even attempt this deal? Surely, as an internationally known crime lord, people would know what he would want to use the planes for, right? Well, Christie had thought it through as well and came up with a solution he would go undercover. At the time, the crime boss had set up multiple websites and front companies where he was presenting himself as a legitimate businessman who was involved in the aviation sector. Going by his middle name, Christopher Vincent, he pushed the image of himself as a keen humanitarian. He wanted people to think that he wanted to buy planes so that he could use them to help aid organizations working in sub-Saharan Africa. By claiming to want to work as a charity and humanitarian organization, he was presenting himself as a well-likable and respectable man whose goal in life was to help those less fortunate than him. The worst thing is, is that it's possible that he might have been able to get government subsidies if his company was working as a non-profit. Christie first put his plan to buy the planes into action in 2019. He started by establishing a link to a small aviation business in Malawi called Nyasa Air Charters Limited. This was a tiny airline involved in humanitarian work. In fact, it was so small that it only had one plane. Christie wanted to use this company as a front so that he could purchase the nine army planes through it without garnering suspicion from authorities. It would also help him look like he had a strong profile in Africa already, meaning he would be looked on favorably by those who wanted to buy from. However, in order to use the company, he first had to take it over. 
In order to do that, Christie began pushing from the formation of a new company called Crescents and Crosses. This company would be set up in Singapore so that it looked as legitimate as possible. Christie explained in an email that he wanted the Crescents and Crosses website to create a smoke and mirrors illusion that we are bigger and better than a mere startup company. So that Crescents and Crosses would be in pole position for aircraft finance and or leasing facilities. Crescents and Crosses was to be the holding company for the deal whilst Nyasa was to use the Egyptian aircraft. Wanting to keep a lower profile, Christie put Zimbabwean businessman Adam Lincoln Woodington Wood as the front man for the deal. He'd worked with Adam for many years and trusted him with the plan. Adam is also tied to several companies that Christie was going to use to try to facilitate the aircraft purchase and other deals. These companies are Sea Dream Homes SL, Sea Dream Middle East General Trading, Dubai based CV Aviation Consulting Services, and Singapore-based Crescents and Crosses PTE Limited. With the creation of their new humanitarian company, Crescents and Crosses underway, Christie and Adam decided to attend the 2019 aviation conference at the Red Sea Resort city of Sham El Sheikh. The event was hosted by the World Food Programme and the now former Egyptian Minister of Civil Aviation, Lieutenant General Yunis El Masri, who was also the commander of Egypt's Air Force until 2018. The conference was attended by people who deliver airborne services to disaster relief programs and other charitable causes. This included the International Committee of the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders, definitely not people who would be associated with crime lords. With his image as a humanitarian established, Christie didn't waste time in making inquiries into purchasing some planes. Shortly after the conference, on January 8, 2020, a man named Ebrahim El Desuki reached out to the Egyptian military. Ibrahim is the managing director of Sea Dream Middle East General Trading, Christie's company, and Christie himself had asked him to oversee the financial dealings of the plan. Ibrahim corresponded with the Egyptian defense attaché in Abu Dhabi, Brigadier Hisham Nabil Monir, and offered over £6 million for the nine planes. Upon hearing the amount of money that was being offered, Brigadier Hisham was happy to progress with the deal. On the 11th of February 2020, the Brigadier sent Sea Dream a list of aircraft for sale along with spare parts and equipment. Overall, there were over 30 planes for sale for Christie to choose from. After confirming that it was the nine Buffalo planes they wanted, Brigadier Hisham sent the relevant technical information to Sea Dream to look over. He also gave the Egyptian Air Force's approval for the company to send a few people to do a field inspection on the aircraft. The inspection took place at the Almaza Air Force Base in Cairo and included Adam as one of the main inspectors. Along with that, the Egyptians handling the deal even agreed to remove the end user certificate from the planes. This meant that Christie would be able to sell them on if he wanted to, which was actually a part of his plan. During all the negotiations, Ibrahim and Adam kept Christie updated via text messages. By December 2020, Christie and his associates were confident that the deal for the planes would go through. Little did they know the difficulties they were about to face. In order for Christie to complete the deal, the Egyptians wanted a 90% down payment on the planes. This was money that Christie simply didn't have at the time. In order to try and raise the capital, Christie and Ibrahim met with Dubai-based moneylender Alpen Asset Advisors Limited. During the meeting, Ibrahim claimed that they would need around £16 million to complete the deal with the Egyptians. He went on to say that they, as a company, could possibly raise 25% of this figure but needed help with the rest. The Alpen representative who was dealing with the case said that she was confused by the deal and if they wanted to go ahead with the loan, she would need a lot more detailed information before she was able to approve any amount of money. Ultimately, unable to produce any more details on the deal due to the criminal nature behind it, Christian Ibrahim walked away empty-handed. But he did not give up. Determined to go through with the deal, Christie approached more banks and lenders, but none of them would give him the money that he needed. With no money to actually buy the planes, Christie had to accept defeat. After 21 months of negotiations and several attempts to secure finance, the deal fell through. But that wasn't the worst of his problems. In April 2022, the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the United States Department of the Treasury imposed sanctions on Christopher Kinahan and his two sons, Christopher Jr. and Daniel Kinahan. The sanctions also targeted several well-known associates of the family in an effort to try and bring down the cartel. 
Then, on the 12th of April 2022, the United States Department of State announced that they were offering a $15 million reward for information leading to the arrest or conviction of the three Kinahan men. With police and special criminal agencies seemingly putting the pressure on to capture Christie, it is thought that he has gone into hiding. Due to it being a slightly more complex process to extradite a criminal from the UAE because of political reasons, it is thought Christie is currently still living in Dubai with his long-term girlfriend. The two had once tried to marry and settle down in Zimbabwe, as it would have put Christie closer to establishing new drug routes and he would have been pretty much left alone there. However, the couple were denied residency status due to the pressure that the US government was putting on the Zimbabwe government. For now, it seems as if Christie is stuck in Dubai, as if he leaves it, he will likely be arrested. However, somehow, I don't think the 65-year-old crime boss will mind living there too much. Though, if something does happen, we'll be sure to make another video and let you know about it. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of Christopher Kinahan in the comments below. And if you want to find out more about the Kinahans, keep an eye out for a follow-up video. Or you can head over to the channel where you can watch our other videos about Christie's son, Daniel Kinahan. Make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons to keep up to date with our new videos. See you next time.